The psychosocial assessment is the first step of the nursing process. It involves the collection, organization, and analysis of information about the patient's health. It paints a picture of the person's emotional state, mental capacity, and behavioral function, and it's the basis for developing a plan of care. The assessment also serves as a baseline to determine the effectiveness of treatment and to measure the patient's progress. A thorough assessment needs participation from the patient. If they aren't willing, there's going to be many parts of the assessment that can't be completed. As we saw in SIM, a depressed patient may not have the energy to answer all of your questions. Or if the patient's psychotic, they may not be able to sit long enough for an assessment, or they may not be able to process your questions. Uh, the nurse may have to try multiple times to actually complete an entire assessment. Health status can also affect the assessment. Anxiety, fatigue, and pain can all make it difficult to pay attention to what the nurse is saying. The patient may need some sort of intervention, whether it be medication or rest or whatever they need, before they can participate in the assessment. The patient's perception of their circumstances can interfere with the assessment. If they don't want to be there or they've had a bad experience in a hospital before, they may be less willing to participate. They might maximize or minimize their symptoms, or they may just refuse to give information at all. The patient could have a harder time understanding what's going on. The nurse will need to look at the patient's primary language. Are you speaking the same language? Is the patient hard of hearing? Are they able to read and write? The nurse's attitude and approach will also influence the assessment. If the patient feels rushed or like the nurse isn't giving them their attention, then they're less likely to participate fully. When you begin the interview, try to make sure it takes place in a comfortable, private, and safe place. It should be fairly quiet with minimal distractions. Don't pick a place that's isolated. You need to stay safe, and so does the patient. If friends or family come with the patient, you should be able to talk to them as well and get their perceptions on the patient's behavior. They may not be comfortable talking about the patient right in front of them, so you may need to take them to a private place. Just remember HIPAA. You can't give information to them without the patient's permission. Open-ended questions are good when beginning the assessment as it allows the patient to start with where they feel comfortable sharing and it lets the nurse get an idea of the patient's perception of their situation. Some examples of open-ended questions. What brings you here today? Tell me what's been happening or how can we help you? If the patient isn't able to concentrate, organize their thoughts, or is having difficulty with open-ended questions, the nurse may need to ask more direct questions. They need to be simple, clear, and direct. Ask only one question at a time, such as, how many hours did you sleep last night? How much alcohol have you been drinking? Have you been thinking about suicide? Remember to stay non-judgmental, especially when you're talking about sensitive issues like substance use and suicide. You need to get a history on the patient in order to find out their age, developmental stage. Is the developmental stage appropriate for their age? Are there any cultural considerations or spiritual needs that we need to be aware of? Any previous history? Ask about family history as well because it can also give us clues. Do any family members have a problem with substance abuse? Are they bipolar? Have there been any successful suicides or any attempts? The nurse needs to look at the patient's overall appearance. How are they dressed? How's their hygiene? And are they grooming themselves? Are they dressed appropriately for their age and for the weather? Are they unkempt or disheveled? Do they seem to be their stated age? Look at their posture, eye contact, facial expressions, and see if they make any unusual movements or have any tics. Assess their speech for quantity, quality, and abnormalities. Do they talk nonstop? Are they stuck on one topic that they can't move on from? Are their responses yes or no without any elaboration? Are they able to answer the question that was asked? Do they talk too fast or too slow? Are they too loud or too soft? Do they rhyme or use neologisms, which are made up words that only the patient understands? And do they stutter or lisp?
Mood is the patient's pervasive and enduring emotional state. Affect is the outward expression of their emotional state. The patient may tell you how they're feeling, or you can infer it from the way they're acting. You also need to assess for consistency. Are they acting the way they say it? Are they acting the way that they say they feel? Some common terms you might see, blunted affect, which is showing little facial expression or they're slow to respond. Broad affect is the full range of emotion. Flat affect is showing no facial expression. Inappropriate affect is a facial expression that's inconsistent with their mood or the situation. Restricted affect is displaying one type of facial expression and that one's usually serious. Mood can be happy, sad, depressed, angry, euphoric, and so forth. When a patient has rapid mood swings from euphoric to depressed, we say they are labile. Thought process refers to how the patient thinks. Thought content is what the patient actually says. Thought process and content also need to be assessed. Does the patient make sense when they're talking? Are the ideas related and do they flow logically? Is the patient preoccupied? Are they paying attention to something or someone else? If the patient is having trouble with thought process or content, focus questions that need only short answers may have to be asked rather than open-ended questions. Some common terms we might see here. Circumstantial thinking. The patient eventually answers, but only after giving excessive and unnecessary detail. Delusion, which is a fixed false belief that is not based in reality. Flight of ideas is an excessive amount and rate of speech that is fragmented with unrelated ideas. Ideas of reference. The patient's inaccurate interpretation that general events are personally directed to them. So the patient hears a speech on TV and thinks that it's meant directly for them. Tangential thinking. They wander off the topic and never actually get around to giving the information that was asked for. Loose associations. Disorganized thinking that jumps from one idea to another with little or no relation between the thoughts. Thought blocking. The patient stops abruptly in the middle of a thought or sentence and is unable to continue. Thought broadcasting. This is a delusional belief that others can hear or they know what the patient is thinking. Thought insertion is another delusional belief, this one where others are putting ideas or thoughts into the patient's head. Thought withdrawal is another delusional belief, this time that other people are taking the patient's thought away and they're powerless to stop it. And word salad, which is a flow of unconnected words that convey no meaning. The nurse has to determine whether or not a patient has suicidal ideation. It's usually best to just ask, do you have any suicidal thoughts? Some questions that you might ask during a suicide assessment. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Do you have a plan to kill yourself? How do you plan to kill yourself? Do you have the means to carry out this plan? Where would you go to kill yourself? When do you plan to kill yourself? The nurse also needs to assess for homicidal ideation. Again, it's usually best to simply ask the patient. What thoughts have you had about hurting someone? Is there someone specific you want to hurt? What's your plan? What do you want to do? If the patient makes a specific threat or has a plan to hurt someone, there's a legal obligation to warn, uh, to warn the person, and it's called duty to warn. This is a time where you are required to break confidentiality. Orientation refers to the patient's ability to recognize person, place, time, and situation. Or does the patient know who they are, where they are, the correct date, and why they're there? It can be charted as oriented times four, or oriented, oriented times one, two, or three. If a person is disoriented, time is the first thing to go, then place, then person. Disoriented is not the same as confused. A confused person can't make sense of their surroundings, even if they are oriented. Both recent and long-term memory should be assessed. Some questions to ask. Who's the current president? Who was the president before that? What's your birthday? What country do you live in? Assessing concentration is done by giving the patient tasks to do, like spell a word forward and backward, start with 100 and subtract 7, then 7 again as far as you can go, repeat the days of the week backward. Abstract thinking is the ability to make associations or interpretations about a situation or a comment. Ask the patient to interpret a proverb like, 
don't cry over spilled milk. If the patient is able to do so, then they can think abstractly. If not, they have concrete thinking and will take what you say literally. Sensory perceptual alterations are hallucinations and can involve any of the five senses. Auditory is the most common, followed by visual. Judgment is the ability to interpret the environment and situation correctly and to adapt behavior and decisions accordingly. Problems in judgment may show up in behavior or activities that show a lack of care for oneself or others, like buying a ticket for a cruise when you don't have enough money to buy food for your family or picking up a stranger in a bar. Insight is the ability to understand the true nature of your situation and to take some personal responsibility for it. Is the patient able to describe the strengths and weaknesses of their behavior, or do they blame someone else for what's happened to them? Do they expect their problems to be solved for them with little or no effort on their part? Self-concept is the way a person sees themselves in terms of personal worth and dignity. Ask the patient to describe themselves, what characteristics they like, what they would change, and what emotions they frequently experience. Are they happy? Sad? Angry? Are they comfortable with these emotions? What coping skills do they have? Ask, what do you do when you have a problem? Or, if you're upset, what do you do to deal with it? Roles and relationships. Each person has various roles. They might be mom, dad, son, wife, nurse, teacher, and so forth. The nurse needs to assess what roles the patient has and whether or not they believe they're fulfilling them. The number and type of roles are going to vary from person to person, but typically they're going to include family, occupation, hobbies, and so forth. Relationships are also important for emotional health. These are going to vary in terms of closeness and significance and intensity. Those who have mental illness may have a more difficult time sustaining relationships. Some questions to ask, do you feel close to your family? Do you have a significant other or do you want one? Are your sexual needs being met? Have you been involved in an abusive relationship? While you may not be doing a full physical assessment of your patients, you will need to assess some physiologic functioning. Emotional problems can affect sleep and eating patterns. Those who are under stress may eat too much or they may not eat at all. They might sleep all day or they may have trouble sleeping. A person in a manic episode of bipolar may go days without sleeping. Someone with severe depression may not be able to get out of bed. Ask the patient about their regular eating and sleeping patterns and then see if they've changed. Is the patient able to perform their ADLs? Ask about chronic health problems and whether or not they take any prescribed medication the way they're prescribed. Do they drink alcohol? Do they use over-the-counter medications? Illegal drugs? Remember to be non-judgmental when you're asking these questions and remind them that truthful answers will help the staff to better care for them. Non-compliance with medication is an important topic to explore. Staff needs to know if the patient is either not taking their medication or isn't taking it as prescribed. Is there a reason they aren't taking their meds? Do they have side effects they don't like? Is the medication not effective? Are they able to afford the medication? After completing the assessment, the nurse analyzes the collected data. This involves thinking about the overall assessment and not just focusing on isolated bits of information. Look for patterns or themes and come to conclusions about the patient's strengths and weaknesses that lead to a nursing diagnosis. The diagnosis is the basis for the plan of care. Assessment is an ongoing process, however, and not a one-time activity. Assessments are done throughout the care of the patient, changing the plan of care as needed. Psychological tests are another source of data. There are two types, intelligence tests and personality tests. Intelligence tests evaluate the patient's cognitive abilities and their intellectual functioning. Personality tests reflect areas like self-concept, impulse control, reality testing, and defense mechanisms. They can be objective with true-false questions or multiple choice questions or projective tests, which are unstructured and are usually interviews. Diagnoses of psychiatric illnesses are found in the DSM. DSM-5 categorizes mental disorders into categories. It describes each disorder and gives diagnostic criteria to distinguish one illness from another. 
Sometimes doctors or other clinicians will perform an abbreviated mental status exam that's known as the mini mental. This focuses on the patient's cognitive abilities and it includes orientation, interpretation of proverbs, mouth calculations, memory both long and short term, identifying common objects, the ability to follow commands, and the ability to copy a simple drawing. The fewer tasks that the patient can complete, the greater the cognitive deficit. Keep in mind that depression and psychosis can impair cognition. This mini mental is sometimes used to screen for dementia. Be aware of any feelings, biases, and values that might interfere with the assessment of a patient. Don't let personal feelings interfere with a patient's treatment. Being self-aware can help you to be open and accepting of others' beliefs and values. You might feel uncomfortable asking about personal issues like sex and suicidal ideation, but they are an important part of the assessment and need to be completed to have an accurate assessment. Listen to the patient without judging them, and the conversations will become easier over time.